You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 148. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast. I have a huge treat for y'all today. I am so excited for you to hear this interview. Full disclosure, after this interview, I was so impressed by today's guest. I actually wound up hiring her to help me clarify some of the high-level strategy for some very exciting upcoming projects in my own business. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. She was incredibly helpful, and I highly recommend you check her out. All of her information is in the description. I think she's the real deal, but I'll let you decide for yourself when you listen to the interview. Her name is Ulrika Stork. Ulrika was born in Germany, trained in the Netherlands, Ukraine, and Germany, and is now based in London. She received her Bachelor of Circus Arts in 2014 and was educated by former Cirque du Soleil artist Juan Lu. Being the spitting image of Hollywood icon Marlena Dietrich, she has made herself a name internationally and took the London cabaret scene by storm with her signature foot-juggling act, Tribute to Marlena. Seen on TV... Film, Channel 4, BBC, ARD, and TFI Friday. I don't know what any of those things are. Well, I know what the BBC is. Anyway, a welcome guest in high-end fashion films and catwalks in Milan and Paris with a mix of high circus skill, breathtaking costumes, and burlesque, Ulrika is the Swiss army knife of entertainment. Working with Cirque Alois in Dubai, she started her journey as an international superstar traveling from Macau to Paris, Texas to Milan and Berlin. Deeply rooted in the heart of cabaret, London is her chosen home, and she created her signature show, Legends, in the West End in 2019, and it was received with a sold-out season. None of this would be possible without Erika being a passionate businesswoman in the performing arts industry. She is the proud founder of the coaching business Let Me Business Growth Coaching and Personal Development to support creative entrepreneurs reach their highest potential and thrive as artists. Yes, here's my interview with Erika Stork. Ulrika Stork. Yeah. Welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing to finally connect with you because I feel like there's so much that people could learn from you. Will you explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me. It's been a long time coming, so I'm very excited also to not only meet you, but to hopefully connect with a lot of other performers. What I do, I am a circus performer and I'm specialized in foot juggling since around eight years full time. I work mainly in the cabaret, vintage, burlesque kind of corner. That's for the performing side of things. I've also produced shows in London and the West End and some corporate stuff. So I've been in all corners of of our job a little bit. Yeah. And you're based in London, but you're, are you Dutch or are you German? Originally? So I am German. I okay. moved to England seven years ago. I lived in London for most of that time. And last year I moved to a little seaside town because, you know, I'm a grandma now, like in my head, not a real grandma, but I just want to live <laughs> by the seaside. <laughs> I totally understand. <laughs> I feel like there's like a moment in everyone's life where they're like, I must leave and find nature. And you're just Absolutely. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Okay. Well, I want to take it back because foot juggling, I'm not sure if I've actually had a foot juggler on the podcast before. It's not, it's a, it's a super traditional art form, but it's not a very Mm -hmm. common one. How did you come into foot juggling? Um, Actually, it was not really my choice in the first place. Um, Yeah. So uh, how far am I allowed to go back? <laughs> because well, all this, the way. We can go all around. the way back. We got time, girl. <laughs> okay. So I started circus when I was 15. So that's now long, long time ago. Like I would, 20 years, I would say, even more. 
And I started with acrobatics. Uh, I was actually a trained trapeze artist and I had a, an accident mm. and I broke my foot and like basically everything in my foot was so destroyed that they, that the doctor said I would never be able to walk again. So I stopped my career for a while. And I remember when I was in that doctor's office, I was pretty young still then. So I must've been 18, I guess. And I remember that the doctor said, I'm so sorry, but um, I had my cast on my foot. And he was like, I don't like, you got to find something else. And I don't think you will be able to walk again like you walked before. And I could feel my entire body say no. I'm like, that's not true. So I just yeah. got up, took my crutches and walked out of the doctor's office and left. And I think this was for many reasons, a crucial moment. Of course, like it took me like four years because still I had to leave school and I did like normal school until I kind of recovered and learned how to walk again. And then I went back to school and I wanted to become a hand balancer because I love handstands. It's my favorite thing to do, but I'm really bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a seaweed. I don't know a <laughs> single hand balancer who thinks they're good at handstands. Actually. Oh no, <laughs> but I'm actually not good. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like I full. Understand. I take my full responsibility for being really crap at handstands. I just like doing it. It's it's fun to it's fun to train. Hmm. So um, being back at circus school when I was 24, actually. So it took me really long to retrain, to get into a circus school. Wow. It was a really like, it was four years or five years, like I moved to Berlin, went to two different schools and trained myself because uh, yeah, I was really out of shape basically. And also I was very old and it, no school wanted to actually take me. And then I went to the last school and I took a kind of like a, a workshop. I was like, okay, they're not going to take me anyway, you know? So I was kind of, I guess, in the right mindset. And I just gave my all. And they were like, awesome, we want you. And I was like, what? I don't know. Okay, fine then. <laughs> <laughs> and then if, you insist, <laughs> if you insist, I was completely shocked because I was already in another training uh, to become a circus pedagogue. I was like, that's the closest I can get to this industry which I love. And then I had to tell my school, I got funding and everything to beat it. And I was like, sorry, guys, see ya. So I moved to Holland. Went oh, to just to interrupt. So a circus pedagogue is a person who teaches circus to kids uh, right. through pedag with pedagogy in schools. You would have groups with disabilities or like they're usually hired for circus workshops. Yeah. This is such a hot word in circus pedagogy. Oh. Like the thing <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh, it's I, oh, I get it but I'm I was like it's not my thing like yeah. yeah it was I was like it's as close as I can get but the moment I had the other offer I was literally I was it. out I was like see ya <laughs> cool so you moved to Holland I moved to Holland uh within a few weeks um was the first time living not in my own country which was quite exciting um, applied with handstands, did my first two years there, got so badly injured again on my shoulder that mm. they said, um, you need to leave the school because you have only two years left and we know you're not going to be able to graduate with handstands. I could barely stand on two hands. But I was, or I am, a very good juggler. Um, I just don't like juggling. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just really good at it. Yeah, the, I'm really good at it, but I don't like doing it. I never enjoyed watching it because, and I never enjoyed really training it because I was in the class with all the boys and we had to stand there for hours and hours, look against the wall and do patterns. And it was just really drove me crazy. Then they said, well, you either leave the school or you do something else. And then I had this absolute angel and guardian that came to me, which was... Juan Lu and my other juggling teacher, Gregor Kirk, they both basically said, you are very flexible. You're a great juggler. You have all the puzzle pieces to become a foot juggler. And I was like, what? Like no one has ever been trained as a foot juggler in that school. There was no equipment. Mm. There was no teacher for it. I didn't even come up with it. So I was like, how is this going to work? But then I was like, I, it took me too long to get here. So I'm not going to be fussy about the discipline. Hmm. Like, I, I couldn't afford to to not do it. 
Interesting. So I kind of became a foot juggler because I wanted to stay. Like I wanted to stay in this industry. And through that, I started to really love it and to really see it as my my thing. And I like it now. And not to date you or anything, but like what year is this? Because like, I don't know, like I even think about like when I was training, like when I was starting my professional training, like Instagram and YouTube and these things, like they were kind of like on their way up. But I don't think Instagram, it like kind of existed, but it was mostly for photographers. It wasn't like what it is now. So like, how did you like even know what foot juggling looked like if you didn't have a coach? Um, a- YouTube and my yeah, coach, sure. so Jian Lu was an, uh, she's from China. She worked in okay. Cirque du Soleil for many years. She, I don't know which show it was. She was like this base on point shoes on light bulbs with 700 people on her shoulder. And yep. she had this attitude that I still admire and take as a inspiration. She was like, she just looked at me. She's like, yeah, it's going to be fine. And I was like, what? She's like. <laughs> don't worry I understand and I was like okay so she took me really under her wings and her husband was working in a theater uh in Rotterdam where I was living at the time and he was working also in tv so we found someone that produced uh, like metal stuff and we kind of I draw a picture of a chair that I wanted because I found all the chairs really ugly so we designed something and then we just basically worked with what we could find online with her experience with you know and then we just tried stuff she was standing on a chair with a stick like a you know with a string on it with a ball to to teach me we just figured it out together and then we kind of trained six to seven days a week because i only had um two years left yeah. Before gr- before graduating, and that was kind of we went completely military. Wow. So yeah, is foot juggling like because there's some disciplines like like an aerial. There's a cap to how much you can train a day where you start just getting negative return. Like it, there's no point in training yeah. anymore. But like juggling, like hand juggling, <laughs> is um like they can train eight hours. Like I've seen jugglers who are just like hours and hours a day. Is foot juggling more like that where you can actually like put in a whole bunch of hours or do you have to stop after three hours? You, like it depends. So in sure. the first in the first year, I needed to adjust my muscles um, because my ch- shins were black from things hitting and my toes were blue and I had like shin splints and I had like cramps constantly. I was like, if this doesn't go away... Like it was, it was absolutely, it was the worst pain I've ever had. It was torture. And I was like, so I needed to wait until my body went, oh, okay. Hmm. This is the, this is the movement I'm going to do with the feet now over and over and over again. And once this adjusted, I could put in, but also I'm extremely military with stuff. So it's, I guess it's my mind and my body working together. I could put in like six hours with breaks. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And you can switch between props as well. There's heavy props where you like the big cigar is like four kilo and it's mm-hmm. hard plastic. It just, at some point it just hurts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then yeah. there's the umbrella, which is like, you know, it's balancing. So I would switch between coordination and muscle work to, to get more hours in basically. And you went to Akapa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went and... to the other one, Code Arts. Oh, you went to Code Arts? Yeah. Right. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to Code Arts in, oh, yeah, of course, in Rotterdam. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what I've heard is that you're given an option. So you have your circus training and then you're given an option to study dance or music or other things. And you chose to study business in that time. No, actually. So uh-huh. there is no option in the school to do any. I mean, maybe now there is. But okay. this is something that I uh, acquired after school for myself. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I was the 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 origin is actually from not having it in school. Huh. I was the person that we had a business class in school, and it was you know like in a lot of schools pretty basic. And you still go out and you're like, how the heck am I going to do this? And because it was my second ra- time round, mm-hmm. I I knew I need to know how to do this because I had a like my time timeline was short or is short. Right. Yeah. And I was like, I need to know how I can make this work as 
fast as possible. And when I, when I had the only training that I got was how to make a business card, I was like, I know that's not going to cut it, <laughs> you know? And I was like, it's great. But so I went, I was the person going to, to our director at that time, by the way, he's amazing. We're still friends. And I was like, I was the person that's having a tantrum and going like, I need more training. This is not okay. <laughs> They're like, yeah. so yeah. And it, I even went into the university, like in CODOTS, there's other departments and there was like project weeks and one week was a business week. Um, and I was the only circus performer that went there with like, you know, I was soaking up everything like a sponge because it was like, I need to learn how to sell. I need to learn how to market. Also, I'm kind of a geek around this kind of stuff. So I was naturally interested, but the urgency and came from what I've been through and on knowing that it's very rare to get a second chance. That was right. my, so I took a business course after that really helped me with with everything. I basically built my career on combining my knowledge as a performer, also doing it two times, basically, and understanding what you have to do and what you don't have to do with the whole business side of things. And over the years now, I kind of developed a program that I teach others as well. I want to go back to something you said, because I think it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you said, you understood through going through perform like uh, through circus school essentially twice what you have to do as a performer and what you don't have to do. Yeah. I think it's very obvious to a lot of people what you have to do as a performer. Mm. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think the things are that like as a performer you have to do? And what are the things that you don't have to do? Because I think that's not so obvious to people. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, actually. There's a few obvious things and there's a few like subtle things. Obvious things that I would always say is you don't need to create five different acts. So you fit every box, but you need to really understand what your niche is. Focus down, focus in, like niche down as much as you can and give all your energy to that. Hmm. So, you know. I had so many conversations and also experienced that in the beginning of my career when I produced a lot of work that was not polished, not finished because I got different. I saw what other people were doing. I'm like, I'm going to do this because I see it working for them. I'm going to do this and I see it working for, for this person or this industry. So I was looking outside of myself and this actually diluted my uniqueness. Mm -hmm. and my talent and why my art is really special. And through this business, because it completely flipped it around where I understood, okay, you just got to do your one thing first, find that, sit in the test phase, like understand that you are in a test phase. And once, this is where a lot of people do things that they don't have to do. Once they found something that works, you got to roll with it. Mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta you gotta stick with it you know because I found my signature act actually quite early in my in my career which is uh the tribute to Marlena because apparently I look like a dead Hollywood star did I expect <sighs> this no did it blow my career up yes you know so I know that a lot of performers including me think that they know what works without looking for the clues so I had people telling me, you look like Marlene Dietrich. I was like, leave me alone. I'm unique. And then I was like, okay, let me listen. Let me listen to what clues I get from what works. And then I just followed these clues of what works step by step. And I stopped doing everything else, you know, without knowing exactly where this is going to bring me. But this step by step brought me to finding this niche for myself, which now is worldwide known to people that I don't even know, mm -hmm. like even outside of the circus industry. I was just asked to headline a burlesque festival for the first time. They never had a circus performer. I, would, I don't even do burlesque. I guess to bring this home is what you don't have to do is to look so much on the outside, but really understand and be, being able to utilize you as the niche. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Well, and it sounds like the other part of what you're saying is like, I think a lot of performers, especially these days and um, living in Montreal, I see this where like, 
especially if you go to the National Circus School, you can tumble. You can, you know, like you have a pretty high level of flexibility. You're doing Chinese pole, you're doing aerial, you're doing, you know, and there's like obviously excellence in one thing. But then I see people leave the school and then they start, they're like, oh, I, I want to do a bunch of hoop diving or I want to create this act in this totally other discipline that I didn't do during school, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what I'm hearing from you is that like, no, have the, have the, I don't even know if it's discipline, the confidence to like, just stick with what you trained and study and know and go deeper into it. Yeah. And Niche I can down. tell you why I can tell yeah, you yeah. why it's the fear of missing out mm. like the fear. And that's not an, only in our industry. I work with a lot of different performers from like acting, musical theater, the fear of sticking to one thing is simply that you, that we are scared that we're not gonna, that we're going to miss out on a job. So I better stay general and available, but this actually does the opposite. And I, I really agree, especially, I think it's these days actually more challenging for generalists that are really multi-talented and high skilled in a lot of different disciplines because our discipline like that we learned is not our niche. That's just a skill we learned. And here is where it's really, you know, that's our so good. That's it's, so good. <laughs> when I like, you know, I've oh just talked. Yeah, I've just talked to 50 different performers uh, for a research project that I'm doing. And I asked, what's your niche? And I heard again and again, handstands. That's not a niche. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's where the gap is between finding the work that you love, finding mm. the clients that will align with your work. And it will be super easy to actually connect and, you know, attract the right people. But no one is... No client imagines a show and puts up this dream that, you know, they're also just people. They create dreams and, and visions of things. And they go, ooh, handstands. No, <laughs> you know, right. they, they think of, I would love to have something really bougie and wild and yes. maybe a little bit sassy and whatever they say, you know, and then they look in this niche, which performers match this. So it's the the secret here is the self-awareness of who you are and then make the boldest version of that and a marketable version of that. I love that. And I had like, yeah. Okay. So my follow-up question is how much of it is you looking inside yourself and finding that boldness, finding that distinctness and uniqueness. And then how much of it is looking at the market and being like, right, there are, you know, like, what is it? 85% of all submissions for castings are aerial, right? So like, even if you make the most distinct, bold aerial act, is the market going to accept that? Or because you have so much competition in it? That's a great question. You know? Or is it a smarter thing to like, go in a different direction, spend two years, three years getting maybe not as like virtuosic in something like foot juggling or you know, any other discipline that takes about three years, but having a really good niche or having a really bold artistic statement there. Do you know? That's, that's a great question. That's a fantastic question that I actually talk a lot about. And the answer is it really, of course, when the market is more saturated, you need to focus on something different. So there is mm. one way to lose, which is when you compete on skill. If you compete on skill, you lose because there's only, there's only a way down. That's the kiss of death. <laughs> so, true. so you so you need to you need to compete on value. Mm. And a performer gains value by, you know, if I would be an aerialist, I would understand what level I need to hit, the basic level, and maybe a little bit above, just to be accepted in the realm of where I want to work. I'm gonna check the technical level. So this is there. But it's not even necessary. And then I would hone into what I can only do. Is it my look? Is it my creativity? Is it, it will be something that only you can do. And that's when you go in and then you make that more important than any skill you will do. Because the goal is always to become so valuable that no matter what you will do, if you do foot juggling or singing or acting in your future, you always want to be an artist that can grow and is valued, not because of your skill, but because of you. And if you have that in the back of your mind, people are super interested, even if you change discipline, 
Mm-hmm. You know, when, when when I started singing and they were like, oh my God, this is awesome. Because it was just under the umbrella of my brand. Does that make sense? It does. It makes a yeah. lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. I don't know. Like I had this fantastic conversation. So I am proudly, I guess, the worst foot juggler in Europe and no one even notices. <laughs> I had the conversation with the other functional. They were like, I don't understand. You are not better than anyone else. Not even close. How do you do it? And I was like, well, I don't care about foot juggling. I, I honestly don't. I really, I could, I, I'm the worst circus artist. I could, I never train. I, I never, ever train because I cannot be bothered to look at the ceiling on my feet. Like, I prefer <laughs> to spend all my time around all the other things that I love and that I know will make me different. Mm. What are those things? Um, Because when I looked at your videos and I looked at your act, yeah, I was like, okay, I've seen a lot better foot jugglers. But I was also like, you're so precise. Like every movement you have is like on the beat. You know where you are on the stage. You know when you're looking. You know when Mm -hmm. you're doing all these things. And so would you say you spend... Like you value that more or are you yeah. talking more like I spend this more time well. marketing than any of that? Or So for me, I had to first understand the client, like my niche has, I had to understand my clients. My clients that I work with are usually very high end. Mm-hmm. They're, they have a lot of money usually. It's bougie shows. So they love beautiful, clean, precise, sassy I knew this is going to make the difference between a technical foot juggler that they just would find ugly because when they look in the face and they have to juggle four things, they look like they have wrinkles in the face and they have to concentrate. (laughs) I don't even want to look at this, you know, (laughs) which is, I don't disrespect this, but this is not my style. So what I, I didn't even check what I like. I understood that my clients are actually very much like me. Mm. Your clients will always be a reflection and a mirror of your of your mm. preference. I my my sister is a fashion designer. Uh, I dress up since I'm four, so I basically just extended my love for dressing up, and I'm known for having incredibly beautiful costumes. Like they're all handmade. They're I don't know. They're super bougie, and I know that I'm a show of object for parties and for when people put me on stage they go like look at this Mm -hmm. yeah so I had to understand the psychology of my clients how do they think what do they I usually have like I have like a Russian client and they have all like young moms that have birthday parties from two-year-olds and they all have Dior dresses on they would just want to show off something what an artist that they found Mm-hmm. more from the looks than than the skills. So I had to find a way to make my art, to make circus look a certain way so that my clients will love it. Because the tragedy with foot juggling is no one likes foot jugglers. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, do you think that ever someone... I inqu- love a foot juggler. I love a... I know. In our industry, but we are not our clients. Mm, like I don't, point. I don't work for my colleagues. I don't work for my friends. They don't pay my bills, so I needed no, to really, right. yeah. Like it's everyone said when I left school, like, oh my god, it's because you're a foot juggler. Pff, forget about it. I had to make people forget that I'm a foot juggler in order mm. to get the jobs that I want. In order to, I worked in Paris Fashion Week because of my brand. And it was in a, in a major advertisement and all that kind of stuff. I had to make, I had to shift what people saw from me. So I, I hear what you're saying. And I'm trying to think of any other art form. Maybe, maybe acting, especially when it comes to like TV and film and those things, where the look is as, if not more important than the craft. Right. Like I'm thinking about like opera, like it doesn't matter if you look the part of like the soprano, you know, like if you can't hit those notes, you're not getting the job. Mm -hmm. Like the prima ballerina in New York City Ballet, like if she can't do, I don't know, 700 pirouettes or whatever ballerinas do, you know, like you're not getting the job. Like there is a technical level to it. And it's interesting that you say like 
it seems like your take is in circus. That's not true. It depends. But don't you think the implications of that are kind of tricky? Well, it depends. Like, I know in my niche it isn't. Because I had mm. to find a niche where it isn't important and not as important. I have my own standards. I want to be respected in our industry. So that's why I said I hit the, the minimum level that I could also achieve in two years. Right. Considering my age, I knew I had to focus on something else. And my niche loves to see a foot juggler. And, you know, I'm still a decent one. Yes. So there's, but I do not enjoy personally working in the circus, circus industry. Hmm. Because it's just not where I feel with what I can offer, where I feel home. Yeah. Yeah. So when you are a performer, that's like enjoying all the technical levels. So one is not better than the other. I think that's something I want to point out. But the most important thing in order for you to find jobs that you love is to understand yourself. And then go in that niche because these people will appreciate you most. and You will actually have a beautiful experience of working. Yeah. I had a very terrible experience of working in the wrong niche first. I was completely rejected because I didn't even want to be there in the first place. I mm. felt I'm not, I constantly felt I'm not good enough. I constantly felt I had to be someone else. I had to like convince people about my worth. And that's when mm. you know you're in the wrong niche. So I, I took everything. I took my ego out. And what people told me and what our industry or not our industry, but what I heard and what I thought where I should be going. And I just went in the opposite direction and I created this, this career for myself that's as versatile and as fun as I wanted it to be, you know, and, and that's the most fulfilling to me. I love that. This is a, a little bit of a selfish question because I feel like I hit a, against this all the time. I'm an artist. But I'm also a coach and I'm also a communicator. I, I run a podcast. I run a business. You know, like I'm doing all of these things. And I'm getting the same advice from people where they're like, well, you really need to niche down. You need to figure out, like, are you going to sell yourself as a performer? Are you going to sell yourself as a coach? And it's like, but I, I find it really fulfilling to do all of these things. In the performing world, I don't find it fulfilling to like be going for certain types of jobs because I know they're not me and they're not what I love to do. But like where my income is coming from, it's really diversified. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Like, How general does niching down get when you're talking about like uh, the life of an artist? I'm not sure I understand yeah, that's an what part. you want to know yeah. from me. <laughs> that's why we just, uh, I think there were, like, I think there was a thought process and I think there were a few questions in there. Is your good? question in how can you actually niche down when you actually like so many things yeah gotcha it's yeah. the same things like we said before for the skills that's your skills you don't have to choose one if you don't want to i'm combining both right you know niching down can be as specific as you want it to i always say Riches are in the niches. So the more you niche down, you know, you're going to be the answer. So niching down within your talents is something that is absolutely going to be the way forward. So the going like, I will only focus on this specific person with my, with my uh, podcast, or I will only specific, and then you narrow everything down and you cook it down to having a combination of the things that you really like. And that right. are under your brand, you know, that's why I always say a niche can be, I mean, obviously you do a podcast, you're very thought provoking and you're like in the kind of thought leader field. So under the, in the thought leader field of being active in our industry, that is a niche. I'm sure without noticing your brand comes through, which is your identity, which is your curious and you're, you're interested in communicating. And so that's why I say having the self-awareness of who you already are, which is a communicator, you just express this through different mediums mm. and through different, I don't know how to say this in English, but once you take the focus from the things that you do to why you do it, it all becomes one in your own perspective. Does I think I sense? just understood something that like, I, cause I, I love reading business books and these kinds of things. And I think you just explained something and I don't know if even I can repeat it right now, but I, yeah, like that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. 
it's because it's like the higher level skill that you have that you yes. can apply to anything. That's basically it. That's the same thing I, I teach to students that go, I don't know what to post on Instagram. I don't know how to, com I'm like, know who you are, like go through the work where you understand what your brand is. And then every decision you take, every choice you make, every action you take is just aligned with this, with mm -hmm. align, aligned with your why, aligned with what you love, aligned with what you hate, aligned with, you know, mm. you can double check it. And that's why I'm saying your niche is a reflection of you. But if you don't know you, then it's hard to, to decide which, what to put out there. Yeah. So what steps do you recommend a person who doesn't know themselves? If that's the fundamental issue, then what do you recommend people do? I think the first thing that I do with my clients is we talk about what you're curious about, what you love, what you enjoy, what you're really good at. I make them talk to family and friends, to like 10 people, and tell them what What's the one thing they would say about them? Like the best thing mm. or they would say, what are you really good at? You know, I did this and then I got feedback and I was like, you're super organized. Everything always looks really beautiful. And you are like always on time. If you see my ads, it's exactly this. Hmm. So it's really first going, go away from your discipline, go away from your, from your tricks. Ask, ask the people that know you most for the three things they know, they, they know about you to be true. And then go from there and see how you can put the volume up and translate that into your work. That's, I think, the first thing I would do. And then also the next thing is to look where, in what area, what clients like that too. Mm, interesting. Because that's, that's essentially what it is. You want to find the people that enjoy the same thing than you, because then it's like magic. You know, my clients enjoy the same things that I do. There is no friction. They wouldn't go, oh, there's this trick missing. They go, oh, this is so beautiful. I'm really happy. This is exactly what I wanted. And yeah. so it's knowing what you love and then finding the people that love that too. It's you know, it's like when we go to parties, when we go to a concert, we go to the place where the same people like the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, yeah. And it's kind of like the same concept, I think. One way that I think about what you are saying is um, I think about like my client or my student is me at a different point in my life, maybe, or at a different tax bracket or something else. But they're like essentially me in some way. Are there instances, though, in which you have a client base that's not you? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Your clients being you doesn't mean they do the same thing, mm. but, they, but they value the same thing. So you want, you want to match values. You don't want to match skills. You don't want to match jobs. You don't want to match income. You don't want to match any of that. Values. You want to match values. Yeah, what we just what we just said before is your core values or your career values, you know? Right. Like know what's important to you and a version of this will speak to your audience. I love vintage and old Hollywood style. My clients do like doesn't need to be vintage, but the common ground that we always have is the word high end. Mm. High end beautiful. So under this, um, this is also like beauty is even one of my biggest life goals, uh, life values. I, you know, I read interior magazine designs. I, my flat looks always really beautiful because it's actually important to me. And my clients recognize this in what I do because it just comes quite naturally for me. Whatever it is, we connect on these subtle levels with someone. Mm -hmm. And you can, that's why I say, if you dial this up and you extract what it is, you can put that in your marketing. You can put that out there. So the right people will recognize it. And then they go, oh, this is for me. And that's essentially what marketing is. And yeah. I love that reframing of it. I think it's really important for people to hear that because so often marketing gets this bad rap where you're lying oh, yeah. to people or you're like selling them, a, I don't know, a flea circus or something. and. Yeah. It's not that. Yeah. Yeah. There is bad marketing, 100%. <laughs> yeah. 
uh-huh. <laughs> you know, there is definitely bad marketing, but you know, I, I, I think we as artists specifically, we want, we really need authenticity mm. because we put ourselves into our work and then marketing can feel very alien suddenly to us, but it's, if you allow it to, to relearn what it is, man, your career will go through the roof and it will feel like one, you know, cool. marketing never feels external for me. It always feels like a, like an extension of what I do and being proudly just sharing intentionally with the right people. Yeah. What I, what I do. Aside from being a performer, you're a business coach. What does your coaching business look like? Because after listening to you for like 40 minutes, I'm like, where can I sign up? Girl, you have <laughs> like, I'm sure you're like so- exploding so many minds of <laughs> listeners and myself. So what, yeah, what does the model look like? Yeah. Do you only offer, do you do one-on-ones? Do you have courses? At the moment, I'm doing a three months one-to-one where I take basically a performer from zero to hero in wherever they want to go basically what we talked about to understand what their niche is and how it practically looks as we meet once a week. Mm -hmm. They have access to a lot of resources and I take them through the process with actually what we just talked about. So there's conversations, there's a lot of worksheets, there is courses to watch that I created for them to relearn and implement and take action. That's basically what it is. And at the moment, you know, when I said I talked to like 50 different performers, that's basically the yeah. the groundwork for a group coaching program that I'm going to make available in the beginning of next year or end of this year. I'm not entirely sure how fast I get this off the ground where I, because I worked from few years now, the same process for a lot of performers and it's, pro- it's proven to just, right. it just works. I mean, I've done it for myself even now with my coaching business, I've just done the same process. And the group coaching program, I think will be another, will be three months long, have live calls and a community and will be more affordable than the, than the one-on-one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have me basically uh, taking you by the hand and training you to be an excellent business woman or man or non-binary, whoever you want to be. Um, and and business human business and everything human. in between exactly yeah mm-hmm. love that do you think there's a certain like level of proficiency that benefits most from your coaching like if someone's like just starting out do you recommend that they go through a process or go through school first you, you know like what I mean people I think that there should be some like the skill has to be there. I think if someone is not even mm-hmm. yet trained as a circus artist or as a performer, you would always have to do that first. You don't need to be at the best level, but basically you need to be able to start working with something. You know, you need to have mm-hmm. some teeth in the game. Uh, I'm just starting actually this week with two people that go from being um, amateurs that want to go into a professional. So that has, that's a good moment because then you just don't waste your time, you know, (laughs) because the the quicker, you know, the the quicker you go through the roof. Uh, I wasted so much time. Yeah. So it's all about like speeding up the process. And the other moment that I noticed where it has like any time in your career, basically where you find yourself somewhere where you don't want to be. Mm, And that mm. can look like that can have different colors. It could be that you're just not hitting the income that you want. It could be that you fu- you know that you have an act that works, but you seem to like miss the goal all the time. Everyone else is always getting into that show that you want to go. Like, or mm. the other day I had someone say, I just you feel like you're giving up and the the industry like spit you out again because you've put years and years into this. And it's like, why do other people that are less good, why are they having, why they're getting all the jobs, not me? So there is like, it's essentially, if you are not having what you want to have right now, which which I 100% think you can, then there's room for growth. 
And then there's room for mm -hmm. for reassessing, you know. And also just generally if you're not happy. Like if you're in toxic environments yeah. where you just where your values are not aligned, that doesn't even need to be the clients. That can be if you're all the time around the wrong performers and you're sick of it, that means you're not in the right yeah. corner. And you're you know, another thing that I yeah I noticed about That's myself when I needed to readjust course, which is when I, I had to go into coaching because I had this feeling of I was not where I wanted to be. And I had this feeling of being resentful. Mm -hmm. So resentful, feeling defeated and not really finding. Another thing is when you feel you're not really finding your identity as a performer. Because it's when you have it, you just know. Mm. And, when, you know, you know, these people that know. And I remember I was always looking, I was like, I just want to have that. I just want to know who I am and I want other people to know who I am. So if you're under this, if you, if you want to get there, then that's a, that's a very good moment. And is your coaching specifically for circus performers? Like, do you look at their acts? You look at their media? Like, could you do this for an opera singer? Yes. Oh, interesting. Because I, yeah. like, cause it's I like, do, how much do you have to know the market and how much do you just know these general principles of so, business and self-awareness? Yeah. The beauty is I work, like, again, I work mostly with circus performers, but mm -hmm. I've worked with musical theater and I've worked with, act. it needs to be live performers and it needs to be wanting to be a solo performer. I mean, of course, there's duos and trios, but it needs to be want to be a standalone act. That's the mm -hmm. only requirement. If you want to be, I don't know, in the West End, part of a group show, not so much my cup of tea because it's a different kind of journey. But even then, it would probably mm -hmm. be helpful to know who you are as a performer, you know, because their books, their book celebrity performers or like standard performers. Right. You know, if you have seen Madonna's concert or Beyonce, she has these two dancers that are just like incredible in branding. And they know who mm, they are. Point. Yeah, yeah totally. so it's it doesn't really matter. And and burlesque, I work a lot with burlesque and drag and dancers that go like, I just want to be a standalone act that is recognized as an authority and leader in my field. But how? Yeah, it's so fun. It sounds like you're doing the thing that you've always uh, wanted to do. Have you ever struggled mm -hmm. with um, like any kind of what is it, they call it imposter syndrome or this confidence? Oh, yeah. Like having all of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. All the time. That doesn't go away. I just don't listen as much anymore. Like mm -hmm. it's there was a time where I really struggled with that. And it was actually when I didn't know who I am. Right. You know, the comfort, like knowing yourself brings such a confidence. And I think when I committed to this practice, I feel it's a practice of, of being this type of performer, not my, having my niche or anything, but being an intentional performer mm -hmm. about my business really helped me to like disconnect and like to take the personal aspect out of, out of it and actually going business about it help me yeah. to like have this confidence a little bit more because I could rely on skills that I learned. I could rely on strategies that are proven that really helped me. But man, I compare myself constantly. Like I always feel, and that's until now, no matter what show I do, that I'm the accident in the show. That I'm the, yeah, that's like, I'm, <laughs> really? I'm, the, I'm the filler act. <laughs> that's the feeling, but I also have common sense. Right. And as a coach as well, obviously, like that's, you know, who am I to do this? Who am I to now tell people how this works? I think it's really important to normalize it. That like, no matter what level you're at, you always feel <laughs> oh like, my God. like, how did I get here? It's do constantly. they know who I, are, do they know? Well, and I think it's an interesting issue because all of what we're talking about is like artist as product. So it's like, you do have to kind of take yourself and look at yourself like from the outside and be like, who am I and how do I market this? Whereas someone who's like selling soup, they're looking at something that's like not them, you know, and maybe they're putting their heart and their soul into their soup, but it's like that recipe, that ingredient, that exists like, 
and they can like put it in the refrigerator and go home for the day and it doesn't matter what kind of I I think I would say the opposite have you ever seen yeah have you ever seen chef's table oh I love that show So, you know, and they put their heart into it. And when they put the plate on the table, they just pray that the person that puts the spoon in their mouth can feel their love, their attention, their Mm. everything they put into it. So this is not unique to our industry. I think the problem is that we want it to be different. Like we like our... (laughs) Because then, then we don't have to do, then we don't have to change anything. Everyone that creates is an artist and everyone has to go through this detaching yourself from your work so you can exponentially grow because you are in charge. If you are so attached, you cannot take care of your work because it's all just emotions, you know? Yeah. But I see it almost like a service to yourself to do this because you want to be not only reacting to everything because then you just feel you're like thrown left and right. You want to be actively responding (laughs) to the things that happen. Oh my gosh, that's such a good point. When I see people having absolute tantrums and feeling personally attacked and everything when they read a contract and then we take this apart and we explain, look in where this conversation comes from and take all the emotions out of it. And suddenly there's just a regular conversation happening and we get negotiation going and everything just suddenly works. It's not different. Everyone that creates stuff is an artist. And if you want it to be different, then you're going to stay where you are, I think. (laughs) And if that's what I mean, what brought you here will, will not bring you there. I always say you can get with being creative and being professional, you can get to a very good level in our industry. But if you want to go to that other level, and we all know exactly what that level is, where you are in charge, that's when you have to do this work. Ulrika, thank you so, like, this is so awesome. I <laughs> I can't wait for everybody to hear this. I'm like, so it is. Yeah. What are, what are we missing? What are, Like, I feel like we just opened another can of worms with like, we could talk about contract so negotiations. Uh-huh. We, could just, we could go on and on. I mean, like, I want to save some, you know, you got to leave the people wanting more. So where can people find you if they want to hire you, if they want to see your work? That's a great um, question. Where's the best place so, to connect with you? So the best place to connect with me, I think, in person is either on Facebook or on Instagram. I am behind all of these accounts. I will reply to messages and I love to say hi to people. So that's an easy way. I have a coaching account and I have a performing account. Um, I would say better come to my coaching account. I'm hanging out more on that one. Mm-hmm. That is mm-hmm. under uh, Storch underscore Ulrike, I think. We'll put it um, all in my, the show notes too for people. So yeah. Refer to it. And my company is called Let Me Academy. So you can join Let Me Academy either by getting in touch with me through my website or through Instagram. It's all very personal. There's no sign up button or anything like that. It all goes through talking with me uh, at this point. Wow. Yeah, and that's a I don't lot know if that's important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, no, but it is. Mm. You know, it's. I think when the group program comes in, and so the way to work with me at the moment is one on one, but I would highly recommend staying on on my radar when the group program comes. If you just listened and you feel like you're at this point, this is going to be a very condensed version of doing this yeah, within cool. a, within a mastermind community with other people going through that. And I think that's going to be pretty magical. And I don't know if that's important, but it's super fun how this company started and why the name is there. I don't know. You can cut this or leave it in. Yeah. Let me know. I, I always, <laughs> so in the pandemic, I started giving, uh, doing Instagram lives and it was, uh, and I called it, let me educate you. Let's keep moving while sitting at home. Like, um, let me entertain you. Exactly. Like, you got it. Right? Yeah. And at that point, I was literally just like, oh my God, I need to like empower people to feel connected to their work. Uh, because for me, it never stopped because I had all these tools. And I was mm-hmm. just like, oh my God, I got to share them immediately. So <laughs> I just gave workshops every Tuesday. And through that, I actually built a big community from the people that I work with now as well. And cool. then it became Let Me Academy. And it's a fully limited company. And 
it's now really lovely. So let me entertain you, came. Let me. Yeah. Me. Yeah. And What's I'm your really, relationship to social media? Are you like a big? I component? love social media. You do. I don't love social media, but I love my people, and that's where my people mm. hang out. I love Good my point. community, and my community hangs out there. Yeah. You know, and it's. Do I love putting stories up? No, no one does. I'm like no. I actually love putting stories up more than I love posting. Yeah, because it's less good, work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's easy. It's fast. Chaotic. It like. <laughs> Whereas I feel like I have to craft posts so much more. No, I mean, I know it's, I have a big vision for myself and what I want to do. Mm. This vision is so large. It's like, and it needs to be bigger than my fears. And when I know that if I get good at social media, I'm happy to do that. It's the same like in circus school. Did I like doing over splits? Hell freaking no. Do I like showing off on stage my middle splits? Hell yes. Yeah. I don't think if you really want something that you can be so picky in the most, in the kindest way of saying this. I mean, of course, if it is absolutely tragic to me, then I'm not going to do it. But if I just don't want to do it, then I'm like, oh, well. I love that. If you really want something, you can't be so picky. Yeah. I mean, you should be no, picky, but it, like with the other things, you should be picky about what you don't do that you that really doesn't serve you. If the needle goes in the right direction, you hit 100%. Mm -hmm. We cannot be attached. Like I would say detach from the outcome and commit to the process 200% because then Love the outcome that. is going to be perfect in its own way. But if you attach to the outcome, this one specific thing, you're out. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Oh, that's great. Let me think about this. Um, you are going to be more than enough by just being you. Not being enough was, I think, the hardest. Yeah. Feeling not being enough because of being me. <laughs> Actually, yeah. You know, not just <laughs> like because you're going to be successful because you are you. That's actually better, that's, I think. Yeah, that's great advice. Mm. Is it advice? Yeah, it's like an affirmation or rule or a, I don't know. Mantra. Yeah. A mantra. A mantra. A mantra. I love a mantra. Mm. A mantra. Shmantra. However you say it. Ulrika, thank you for this like free business consultation call <laughs> that I've <laughs> weaseled my way into. <laughs> I love Somehow. this conversation, honestly. <laughs> I could do this all day long. It's my favorite thing in the world. So I thank you for asking me beautiful questions and having this conversation with me. Thanks for listening, friends, fans, and foes. I'll talk at you next week. In the meantime, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and show some love, send some support, just like these fine Patreons that you are about to hear the voices of right now. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful Northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life, and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at DomUpsideDown or my website, DomUpsideDown.com. Aloha! My name is Beth Russell, and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee, and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day 
and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.